Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Sterile, Pro Sterile Processing Notes for Managing an ASC sponsored by HealthMark. I'm Erica Carbajal with Becker's Hospital Review. Before we start off, I'm going to walk through just a few quick housekeeping instructions here. So first, we will start off today's webinar with a presentation and we will have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. So you can go ahead and submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into that Q&A box that you should see on your screen. And today's session is also being recorded, so it will be available after the event. You can go ahead and use the same login information that you used for today's webinar to access that recording once it's available. And if at any time you don't see your slides moving or have trouble with the audio, just try refreshing your browser. You can also use that Q&A box for any technical questions. We're here to help with those. Today we are joined by Melinda Alamari. Melinda is a clinical education specialist for Healthmark Industries, and she began her career in the medical field as a surgical technologist specializing in open heart surgery. Throughout her career, Melinda has served in a variety of positions in sterile processing, such as Interim Director of Education and Quality at the Medical University of South Carolina, and Sterile Processing Educator and Quality Control Manager for Duke Rally Hospital, and the lead instructor for the, for the Central Sterile Program, at Durham Technical Community College. She holds several certifications in sterile processing and is an active member of AAMI. At this time, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Melinda to begin the presentation. Thank you so much, Erica, I appreciate that. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm really excited to be able to have this opportunity to present. Um, I like to call this Cliff Notes um, because it's just a quick synopsis, and I say that, but then I tend to talk too much. So um, hopefully uh, my teammates will keep me on track for time frame. But let's go ahead and get into it. So here's our quick objectives. We want to explain the importance of point of use treatment, define necessary requirements and key components that lead to better patient outcomes, and to discuss the impact of quality measures in sterile processing. So quick intro, um, the concept that I was going for with this presentation is highlighting the fact that working in an ambulatory cent surgery center, an ASC, it has unique challenges that are unique to themselves um, apart from a healthcare facility. And some of those unique challenges are like inventory levels. A lot of ASCs are performing uh, procedures with a limited inventory level. Um, case turnaround time. So the procedures tend to be quick procedures, so they're quick. Um, so those tend to have quick turnover times, which taking into account low inventory levels creates their own problems in itself. And those rapid turnovers um, are they possibly can lead to a high immediate use sterilization, so IUSS. Um, transportation of instruments is another factor and susceptible to um, breaks in standards and processes because of that high turnover. So don't come for me. I'm not saying that every facility breaks their standards and processes, um, but I will say that it tends to happen more often than not. So when we go through the slides, the basic concept is I'm going over basic things for um, an SPD department that relates to any SPD department, no matter where you stand. And these are key factors that I've seen um, come into play quite often in contributing to a break in those standards and processes. And it's basically lack of knowledge. So the goal is basically to help you establish that knowledge level so that standards um, and uh, policies and stuff can be written around those. All right, so first up is our point of use treatment. So we're beginning with point of use. So what does the A team have to say about point of use? And who, are, who is our A team? Our A team is Amy, AST, and AORN. 
So all three of these organizations basically state that talk about the importance of point of use cleaning. And AORN even preferences with talking about biofilm and how important that point of use cleaning is in preventing biofilm. When biofilm is present on an instrument, it makes it 10,000 times harder for an SPD staff member to clean those instruments. So point of use is important. Also, what's important is how the instruments are transported down to uh, decontam. So Amy states, prevention of instrument damage in their section of prevention of instrument damage after pre-cleaning at point of use prior to transportation, instruments should be prepared in such a way to prevent organic soils from drying. And they give some examples on how to do that. So three ways are placing a moistened towel. And so the towel is moistened with water, not saline. Um, Package designed to maintain humidity. And once again, the key word here is designed, um, not using like a biohazard trash bag and think that that's okay. Um, these packages are uh, designed to hold humidity in the package and keep the instruments moist for up to three days. And then you have your foam or sprays, which allows for up to 72 hours um, prior to the decontam process. So while towels are an option, they are not the best option because they do not hold the instruments moist for extended periods of time if you're in that situation. So when we talked about water, why are we saying water not saline? So saline is the total destruction of your instruments. <laughs> okay, so saline and instruments don't mix. Um, blood, other body fluids, and saline are highly corrosive and can cause pitting of your instruments. Um, so that's why it's really important that we use water, as stated in Amy as well. And here you can see we have some pictures of what pitting it's like if you take a pin and I just start jabbing at your instrument, all those little holes that show up in your instrument, that's pitting of your instruments. That pitting then leads to rust. It also only takes 20 minutes um, to break down, for blood, sorry, to break down the passivation layer of your instrument. And you're asking, what's a passivation layer? So a passivation layer is the last, um, is a protective layer that's put on the instruments to help protect your storage and the life of the instruments. Once the passivation layer is damaged and um, de like destroyed, then that's where you start getting rusting and pitting and the metal, um, access to the metal, which creates a problem for the life of the instrument. So you can see this poor little plier has met its end um, and after a simple ortho case, so. Also, we talked about the A-team. What does Joint Commission say? So Joint Commission releases booster packs every year. And so this one is from 2017, um, but they also have numerous ones, like they have one that comes out and it talks about point of use cleaning because it's been such an important factor. And this kind of goes back to 2017 where it really started showing up in Joint Commission's focus. Um, and Lately, it's really been something they're honing in on. And here, Joint Commission talks about point-of-use cleaning, the steps, and what they're looking for when we're talking about point-of-use cleaning. So point-of-use cleaning in the OR. Um, so basically, a recap, you want to flush all your lumens with water. You want to wipe um, with a wet cloth, once again, water and remove disposable items. This includes liners, and this is something, liners and indicators we see often being sent down to decontam. And according to the A-team, all of this stuff should be removed prior to being sent to the decontam. Place in the correct basket, 
And um, so like I like stated here, use the count sheets that come in the trays to help with this process. Place um, the instruments in the basket in the open position. And then the last one here would be spray. Spray them, put them in your pack, however you're going to transport the instruments. So for this, I really suggest making a simple sign that's maybe seven to 10 steps with some pictures, basic words, one or two words, and have it hanging in the OR. I found in my career that that really helped just the, the OR staff remember what their process should be and what they need to be doing. So we know point of use is important for patient care. The ramifications of not doing point of use is damage to your instrument, um, extended turnover time, um, and as these are uh, these articles state, you can have risk to the patient, right? And so we do not want to be one of those facilities that are in the news like this. So Mr. T has a message. Don't be the fool who doesn't create clean. All right, so now we talked about point of use. Let's go into the SPD world and starting with decontam. So we're starting with PPE. I cannot express how many times I go into a facility and the staff members, they are, their PPE is not on correctly. Um, they are wearing half a PPE. Um, so your staff should know and be able to speak how to don and doffer PPE in the correct uh, sequence, sorry. And something simple like uh, this poster that um, I put together at one of our facilities, it really helps staff remember and have a reference. Use your staff to do this. It really helps build the morale with the staff as well. Um, you know, pick somebody, tell them dress up, somebody who truly does the process correctly, let them be the model. And then just like I did, put numbers pointing to what they need to do first, putting it on, laminate it, and hang it in decontam. Make sure the other thing is that they're tying their gowns correctly. I see people so often like wrap the string around their waist, tie it in the front. That should not be the case with your PPE because we know your front is the area that gets the most damage or the most fire burden. So let's get talk about our enzymatic detergent in decontam. This is another topic that comes up quite often and staff do not know too much information about it and nor do the manager. So um, this is just some basic information about our enzymatic. So we have different types. We have protease, lipase, and amylase um, enzymatics. Most often it's the protease enzymatic that we use. Um, and our detergent is made up of emulsifiers and surfactants and slating agents. And so you ask, what are surfactants? So they are um, very important for our process for cleaning instruments. They're made up of a polar head and a very long nonpolar tail. And you can shorten it down to like a lollipop. So if we look at the picture over to our left, the um, roll-up picture, this is a demonstration of how laundry detergent takes stains off of your clothes. And it basically works the same concept. Any soap is, has surfactants in it. So the stick end of our lollipop is, is attracted to this type of stain. So whether that is a fat or a starch um, or a protein. And then the polar heads are attracted to the water molecules. So they basically grab onto the stain, lift it up. When they lift up, they create what's called a micelle. And you guys might have heard of micelles more recent in the media. A lot of people are talking about micelle water for cleaning your face. And, and so it's basically supposed to do the same concept. 
So this is really how your enzymatics work um, and your surfactants. And you're saying, like, yeah, Melinda, who cares? But there, it's really important to understand this because we have to understand the importance with our temperature range. And most enzymatics have a temperature range. Most of them say don't exceed 140. Um, but each IFU is different, so you need to look at your IFUs for your enzymatic depending on which brand you're using. So what's the big deal if we go over 140? Well, if you go over 140, you basically just cook the little critters. They're not doing anything for you. So we just burnt them, they're dead. Um, and then if we go below the minimum that they stated um, in their ISUs, then you base, they're basically hibernating, right? They're not active, they're sluggish, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So it's really important we have that nice sweet spot for temperature range um, and we know and understand and staff know and understand that. Detergent um, must be diluted correctly. That's another key factor. So we see sinks that are marked and people just fill their sinks way above um, or way below, right? They're like, oh, I don't need that much water. However, they have automatic dosing systems that are, um, are calibrated to, a certain, to dispense a certain amount per what that sink line is. So if your sink line's at 10 gallons and your enzymatic says half an ounce of enzymatic per gallon, your, your dispenser should be dispensing five ounces. Um, and if you, you don't fill up to that line, you basically are now, you have more, less water and the same amount of enzymatic, you're creating, uh, um, it's gonna be harder for you to rinse your instrument. And then if you go above, you're diluting your enzymatic too much. So once again, sweet spot for temperature, also your level of um, your water level making sure that those are followed. And then um, marking your chemicals in your machine daily. So like pictured, with your automatic dispensers for your washers, your cart washers and stuff, there's no real way to show how much is being dispensed each cycle. I mean, your machine says that it is, but to ensure that you're actually getting enzymatic go through, you want to go through on a daily basis, draw a line um, and mark, you know, your initials and the date. And, you know, so this way you can see that enzymatic is actually going down over periods of time um, versus, you know, it's been a month and I've, my enzymatic hasn't been changed. So this is a good way to do that. So let's talk about our three sink process. So I've gone into facilities where they take a dirty tray and stick it straight into the washer. Um, and while that is not necessarily against standards, when we look at what the items are inside those trays, it creates a problem, right? There's lumened items inside those trays. There's items that have hinges that are not open. So following a three sink process prior to putting in the washer really helps eliminate the bio burden reaching the other side. So your first sink should be a pre-rinse, cold spray, power spray. Your instrument should be in the open position at this point. Your second sink should be your hot, this is where your enzymatic is, so whatever your temperature range is, um, and whatever time frame your enzymatic states. So five minutes um, is the usual, three to five minutes, so it just depends on what your enzymatic states, and making sure you're filling to the line. Your post rinse is warm water, so the point of this is to spray off any excess bio burden and to spray off your enzymatic from your instrument. Your workflow should go from dirty to clean. This is a must. You, there really should be strict rules around establishing a dirty to clean workflow in your decontam. 
I even suggest um, putting up a laminated sign that says that, dirty to clean. Um, and speaking of signs to another sign laminated or um, something just indicating how much enzymatic goes in your sink, um, how much gallons of water is in your sink. So Joint Commission has, I think for the last, I don't know, six years has been asking my staff, that's one of their key spots that they go and ask and talk to, talk about, um, talk to the staff about how do you know how much enzymatic to put in here? How do you know how much water is in your sink line? All that kind of stuff. So putting up a sheet for them or something that they forget, they, you know, they get nervous when Joint Commission's standing there, they forget. Um, so just trying to make it easy for them. Um, every lumen must be brushed and flushed. Um, tapered ends is, so you wanna go from your smaller end to your larger end. And what are tapered ends? suction, so stuff like your Fukushima, um, a lot of your teardrop suction. You look at the at your pen, That's a, your pen is a tapered item that goes from a fat end all the way down to the skinny end at the tip. So you want to, like I said, make sure your, your sink is filled um, prior uh, to the proper level, but also prior to putting your enzymatic uh, detergent or your enzymatic into your sink, make sure your sink is filled. So you want your sink filled and then dispense your enzymatic. This reduces the amount of bubbles so you can see that staff are protecting themselves. Um, and then also, like I like to tell staff, you don't know if Candyman's coming up out of that sink with their hook. I mean, at least you get a warning that he's coming, you can see him. Um, correct temperature we talked about. And then instruments. Your instruments must be brushed under water. Uh, this is another key point. I see staff standing there and just brushing their instruments away above water. What we're doing when we brush, we're aerosolizing all those microorganisms into the air, and it's just, yes, we have negative pressure. We have negative airflow in the, in the department in decontam. However, we're not, you know, why add that to it? So brushing underwater is the only um way to, to brush actually. So you want to use the correct brush for the job. So making sure that you have the right size. If you have arthroscopy shavers, making sure that you have a shaver brush. Um, you have the correct uh, quote unquote toothbrush for the job or the correct lumen brush. Reusable brushes are processed through the washer um, and returned to decontam in a defined area. So whether you guys you do it at the end of each shift or at the end of the day, um, that needs to be established and determined and everybody follow through with that as a standard work operation. One thing I do want to caution really hard with is wire brushes. So wire brushes are created for a purpose. They have a reason. And some IFUs state that you can use a wire brush. However, most items like your hemostats and towel clips, your basic stainless steel instruments, wire brushes are very damaging to those instruments. That passivation layer that I referred to earlier, that wire brush will destroy that passivation layer if it's not used right. So wire brushes are made for stuff like tungsten carbide, um, and that can be found in your gold handle needle holders. Um, that little gray padding. However, the problem is most staff don't stop there. If they have um, a J hook that was just used in a laparoscopic case and they can't get the burnt bio burn off of it, they're gonna grab that wire brush and start scrubbing. We wind up seeing that that damages laparoscopic instruments, the tips and the insulation of the instruments. So please, please be very cautious with wire brushes. I actually, I always suggest to make sure you take to take them out of the department. But all right, let's go. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, ultrasonic cleaners. So let's talk about our ultrasonic. Um, so what is it and why is it important? Ultrasonics use cavitation to perform their pro to perform the process that the machine is intended for, right? So it uses sound waves 
from one transducer to another. Um, at, I'm sorry, sound waves that travel from one transducer to another. And this creates the cavitation bubbles inside your sonic. And those cavitation bubbles are special because they implode on themselves. And so not explode, kind of like, you know, my head right now is floating, uh, but imploding, kind of like you're taking down a building that falls on top of itself. Um, instruments must be pre-cleaned prior to placing in the sonic. So I get this question often, you know, just, oh, I can just take this bloody ortho vendor tray and stick it right in the sonic, right? No, we cannot. Um, doing so, you put too much sediment in your sonic, and then there is no way for the um, sound waves to travel, and you don't get the cavitation bubbles. So you basically have a water bath. Um, you cannot stack trays in the sonic. So I, that's another one that comes up and ensure correct cycles chosen. So whether you're doing laparoscopic, Da Vinci, if your machine has different cycles for those, which most do, make sure you're choosing the correct cycle. Things that are a no-go for your sonic power equipment. I have yet to see an IFU that says a power saw or something can go into the sonic. Um, now, once again, I have used Trump what Melinda's saying here, right? So power equipment, scopes, why scopes? The seals, the little glue that holds the lenses on your scopes, that sonic, those little bubbles will go in and break all that glue right off of your, your seal. Um, and pretty soon, before you know it, your lenses are falling out of your scopes. Cords. Obviously, electrical, eye instruments. So eye instruments um, you can put into a sonic if the sonic is specific for eye instruments because they need a specific type of neutral detergent or enzymatic. Things that are good, lumen items. You should put lumen items in your sonic. Da Vinci items, kerosens, round drawers, ortho loaner trays. All of these things, this is where your sonic helps. Please remember your Sonic is not a, a machine to clean. It is there as an aid to help you. So I want you guys all to remember that picture in the middle there with the blue uh, Da Vinci arms in it. It's gonna come up in your homework later. So let's talk about the correct way to place instruments in the washer. So our correct way is to make sure each your layers of your trays are separate. Um, your instruments are open for laparoscopic, uh, taking them off the holder. Once again, this is per IFU, and most IFUs for those holders say do not put them through the washer on them. Silicone mats must be removed. This is per Amy and most IFUs. Insulated instruments separated from non-insulated instruments to protect them. So holding your instruments open, there are a lot of things on the market that help us with this. So um, stringers that open and extend, to make them wide enough to go through your washer. You can just stand your instruments up if you don't have anything, worst case scenario. And then there's also stuff like cradles that help hold your instruments open through the washing process. So let's talk about some key factors in instrument packaging. So placement of indicators, this is a big one, guys. <laughs> um, I see in facilities, people will just like, I've seen multiple different things happen. Um, I've either seen them put three to four into a tray. I've seen people basically think that indicators are sprinkles and just start sprinkling them into the trays. In this case, more is not better. Um, you want to check with your indicators ISUs. Most of them give guidance on where you're supposed to place your indicators. And for the most part, they're pretty much the same concept. So Amy says that the area least accessible to the steam penetration or the surrounding penetration is where your indicator should be placed. So that means for something like wrap trays, you need one indicator in the middle of your tray. And now this is the bottom of your tray before you put all your instruments in. So you need one indicator in the middle because when you wrap, 
all the layers are right in the center, which creates it, which makes the hardest place for the steam to penetrate. Containerized trays. You need two indicators in the opposite corners of your trays. Why? When the steam gets into your tray, it has to travel into the filters of your trays and reach around into the corners of your tray. So this is why putting them in the opposite corners and two. So we don't want to put more because if one of them doesn't change, then your whole tray is considered not, can be considered not sterile. Any type of containment device. So this is screw caddies, bags um, that we put into our trays. Every bag must contain an indicator inside it. Any type of containment device has to contain an indicator inside of it. Even if you put your count sheet in your tray, which it should be in a bag if you are putting it inside your tray, it must contain a indicator. So peel packs. Let's talk about our peel packs. All right, so here we have a lovely picture of what should not happen with a peel pack. They cannot be folded in any way, so no folding your inner peel pack to fit the outer peel pack. Um, labeling is done with a non-toxic marker on the plastic side, never right on the paper, as you see in the picture. Um, and you cannot use rigid container, um, or they cannot be used in a rigid container or wrap trays. So. You cannot take a peel pack and stick all your forceps in it and stick it inside your rigid container. Peel packs, rigid container, wraps are considered outside containment devices. And outside containment devices cannot be put inside a containment device. Your seal must be flat with no creases or wrinkles. Instruments at least one inch away from the edge of the peel pouch and tips should be protected from damage from poking through. Instruments with hinges must remain in the open position. All right, so pay attention to manufacturing shelf life. This has become a big topic for debate lately. Um, a lot of places they do event-related sterility. However, please remember as my um, teammate stated, the shelf life of your peel pack is an event. So if it says it is only once you sterilize it, it can only stay on the shelf for six months, you have to follow that six month rule. That trumps the event related sterility concept. Um, the other thing is besides that expiration dates, it's double peel packing. So making sure that your peel pouches are validated for that. And also the items that you are peel packing. So can a suction go in that peel pouch? Have they been validated for that? Um, you'll be surprised to know some of them will have not. So this is a picture of a nice um, opened instrument, peel packed, labeled, ready to go. One bad thing about this picture, and usually I ask the audience to guess what it is, but the, whole, the ring part of the instrument should be facing the top of the peel pouch. So when it's open, that's the part the tech is grabbing. The other thing is, please do not po uh, puncture holes in the peel pack um, to like for storage and stuff like that. I have seen that quite a bit too. All right, so let's talk about wraps now. So just once again, outside containment devices are never to be used inside a containment device. So. That also means you cannot wrap a rigid, a rigid tray. <laughs> um, most people are like, why? Why would anybody do that? But I've seen it. All right, you want to choose your correct size wrap. Um, you don't want excessive material because it makes it hard for the sterilant to get in. Um, and then if it's not large enough, you can um, compromise the steril um, aseptic presentation. So your first flap, when you're wrapping, um, you want it to come over and touch the back bottom of the tray. Do not tuck under the tray. I see this quite often. Um, and I've seen actually a whole Cynthia screw removal set and um, 
I'm sorry, uh, Cynthia's locking screw set get flipped onto the floor because the technician was trying to pull that. It was tucked underneath so bad. Um, wraps cannot be placed inside a rigid container or a peel pack. Same thing with peel packs we just talked about. Um, tape, you can't use this tape on the inside of your rigid container or your peel pack or to hold your flaps on your um, wrap tray. And so you have here a nice example from Isham of uh, how to actually wrap your tray. One of the biggest things that you can see in these pictures is that the edges of the wrap are now being taught to be walked out so that they line up with the edge of the tray. Um, so no, gone is that basic envelope look concept that we, we were used to. So here is a nice example of a wrap tray. Um, and then labeling. So this is something that was taught more often. Now it's kind of fall by the wayside, but is a good practice. Even if you have a barcode sticker, we all know that those barcode stickers can come off with the moving of the trays back and forth. It is good practice to write what the tray is on your tape. And the reason for this is if that barcode comes off and there's no identification and that tray is needed in an emergency situation, a simple five seconds of, hey, let me write what the name of this tray is, the date, and my initials um, could have saved a lot of hurt. So, all right, so we did peel packs and wraps. Let's talk about containers. I'm going to kind of click through these to get them up real quick. All right, we want to check for bioburden. Obviously, we want to make sure our trays are clean. Um, and I always teach staff to make sure you just wipe the, the inside. Use a, a cloth, a dry cloth, something. But stick your hand in there, wipe it around, um, because there's stuff sometimes like cement. Oh, cement is so much fun. And it gets inside those containers. And, you know, sometimes cement dries clear and you can't really see it. So. Um, utilizing something to wipe helps. Completely dry, so this is really important when you're talking about sterad specifically because any moisture um, does not, is not conducive with the sterad or the pro process, hydrogen peroxide. Um, you want to check your gaskets for any cracks or breaks. You want to make sure your lid is the same brand as the bottom. If you're using Asculap, they both have to match. Jarrett, whatever it is, you have to match your top and bottom. You want to make sure you have no dents in the container. So any dents can compromise the sterility of your container. You want to check your container if it has bottom filters. So this is something that gets missed a lot, especially now most trays don't need bottom um, filters. So most of them don't have it but some do, and so staff kind of get confused and forget to check, but once again, that wiping, that's where it also helps to see if you have filters at the bottom. Gravity trays, those are the ones that should have filters at the top and bottom, so if you're doing gravity cycles, want to make sure that you have filters at top and bottom. You want to check that you have the correct type of filter, so just not every filter is made for every sterilization modality. So um, those made for steam, sterad, vice versa, ETO, whatever it may be. And then you want to check your filter. You want to make sure that you're holding your filter up to the light prior to putting it into the tray. So if it has just a little pinhole, if light shining through just a little pinhole, that can allow millions of microorganisms into your tray. So please make sure that you are um, holding it up to the light and checking. And your filters should never be folded, so they need to be flat. So when you're putting that filter retention plate on, make sure that they remain flat. So, all right, that takes care of our three main packaging. Let's talk about sterilization process. So here we have a picture of our sterilizer cart. Um, the correct way to load this cart 
is not what's pictured. <laughs> so your trays should be placed horizontally, never on their side unless um, they are items without perforation, so such as basins and mayo stands. Peel packs placed in a holder on their edge facing the same direction, never piled on top of one another. That prevents them from doing what they need to do inside that sterilizer, which is expanding and contracting. Um, containers should be flat, never stacked unless validated to do so. There's very, there are some containers that are validated to be stacked, um, but please make sure those that are doing it are about, those are the ones validated for that process. Trays should sit on the cart, not hang off. Your PCD should be placed flat on the cart over the drain line. Wrap trays always over containers, um, not vice versa. And heavy items should be on the bottom shelves below the lighter items. So oh, this one is wrong. Let's talk about our physical monitor example. So there are four different types of monitoring, administrative, physical, chemical, and biological. Administrative is basically your policies, your procedures that are in place, um, physical. So Amy talks about physical monitoring. Joint Commission requires CS and staff to know how to properly read and look at physical monitors. So for instance, our printout here, understanding where what their machine is set for. No longer is it um, acceptable just to say, oh, yeah, my temperature was 273, four minutes. That's not Joint Commission wants them to be able to read these printouts and be able to say, yeah, it held in a 270 range or above for four minutes, and this is how I can read it and show you. Um, documentation, uh, sterilization of temperature, pressure, and sterilization time. This is also uh, mentioned in our Amy new, the new Amy amendments um, for SP79 in 13.3.3. Um, usually it's the first line in, ster in the sterilization process. So like I have circled, those are usually the numbers that get documented. Um, however, if your policy and process is something different, just make sure every staff is on the same page and they know what they're documenting. Um, for this sterilizer, your pressure range must hold between 28 to 32. So this can vary depending on if you are in um, how, how much above sea level you are. Um, all those kind of aspects play a part in pressure. So most machines, they're set to add the basic 14 atmospheric pressure additional to your, to your actual pressure point. Um, and then so like this one, this actual machine takes it out. So it just shows you what your pressure range reached. Other machines leave it in. So you'll see a pressure range of like um, 42 to 46 or whatever it may be. But just make sure that you know what your pressure range is set for from your manufacturer and staff can speak to it. And then you want to make sure they initial that printout. And they want to understand that's what they're initialing about. Um, so let's talk about our chemical. So we got six types of CIs, um, and Amy identified six types. Um, so they used to be called classes, and you look at Annex N and Amy, you can talk, you'll see why they were changed according to FDA. So type one is your process indicator. Um, so like your tape, this basically shows you this item has been sterilized and this item hasn't been sterilized. That's really what that indicator is for. Um, type two is specific test, like your Bowie DIC. Type three is single critical process variables. Four is multi-critical process variable indicators. Type five, these guys are so special, they got names, right? So they're like, oh, we like this kid, so we're gonna name him. Um, this type five is named an integrating indicator. Um, and the thing that's so special about this one is it runs parallel to a biological. It does not replace the biological, but runs parallel to it. Type six was named emulating indicator. And these little guys, 
they are special, but they're the problem child because they are specific to certain sterilization cycles. You have to match the type of the exact cycle. All right. So we talked about dynamic air being a class two or type two, um, a dynamic air removal test, which is a dart test, also known as a Bowie disc most commonly. Um, and these should be performed each day, the sterilizers in use before the first process load. You only use to test pre-vacuum cycles. This is actually used to test the vacuum pull of your machine. And inadvertently, it's also testing the gasket. So just like at home, your vacuum, if you don't have a good seal, you're not going to get that good suction. Um, so same concept. Um, your readout must be uniform in color throughout. So you can see a picture of what's pass or fail. And most manufacturers provide that. Your biological monitoring. So with these, um, Sorry, I forgot to mention your belly dicks also over the drain. Uh, same thing with your biological monitors. So um, biological indicators are the only sterilization process monitoring device that provide direct measure of lethality of the process. So meaning this is what you need to state that your item is actually sterile. Just because your indicator changed does not mean that that is sterile. Your biological is what determines the sterility. So there's various types of BIs um, available. Your BIs contain spores. Um, the hardest to kill before prions. So when we look at our chain of microbial kill, prions are the top. We can't use them because they need extended uh, processing time. We use Geobacillus sterosomophilus for steam, sterad, vpro, um, Bacillus atrophius, those are the outliers for EO and dry heat. So pretty much everything else uses the geobacillus one. Your control BI is created every 24 hours or when a new lot number is used. So making sure staff understand that. They change a box of lot number, I am biological, they have to create a new BI. Each indicate, each incubator, sorry, should also have a control BI placed inside it. You want to mark it with the date and the letter C for control. Um, this is not sterilized prior to incubation. And after incubation, it turns yellow to show growth. So this act as, acts as a visual comparison to show what a live, uh, what the live spores look like. And then when you kill them, they stay the blue. So, the live spores are um, when you give them the right food, which we do inside those little biologicals, the temperature they love in your incubator, um, and the darkness they love also in the incubator, they grow. And they let off a fluorescent um, chemical, which winds up turning your purple to yellow. So just making sure staff understand the importance of that control. Labeling. So this is another area for contention that people get really frustrated with. It is not okay to stick a load sticker on your biological. You put it down to low, you will block your incubator from doing its job. Putting it on the cap, more often there's vent, uh, vents on the cap. And if you put it on the cap, you block that. Or there's a chemical indicator at the top of your cap. So writing on your um, or labeling it should be done in the location that's specified on your actual biological. Um, and then this also should be done whether you're using a tracking system or not. I, numerous times people tell me, well, I put in my tracking system where it, what incubator it's in. So I know that load seven was in, in well number three. Well, then I go over and I, you know, I try to tip their table and they look at me and think I'm crazy. I'm like, okay, well, what if something happened? What if your table did accidentally get tipped? Or how would you know where those biological, which load those biologicals were from? So please make sure you're labeling your biologicals regardless. All right, your process challenge device, your PCD. Once again, this is the pack that contains your biological and your um, class five chemical indicator. 
So these are placed over your drain line um, because they're the most challenging area. And then each cycle type must be tested. So whether you're doing a pre-vac or gravity, um, even with your Sterad, you're doing or VPro, you're doing advanced standard. Every cycle should be tested. Um, Amy standards uh, for frequency of testing state that it's a minimum of weekly, preferably daily, or with any load containing an implantable device. But best, best practice we say is to run a PCD with every load. And so why do we say that is because when we talk about recalls, the rule for recalls is you recall back to your last negative biological. So if I ran one, a load and a PCD in the first load of my day, six loads later I ran implants and that one failed. I now have to recall six loads versus one load. So some people do it to save money, but in the end you could wind up not saving money. All right, and that's just an example of where to place your PCD. All right, so this just basically states that if you have a major repair, and this is in Amy, that after that major repair, you're supposed to do three consecutive um, PCDs followed by three consecutive Bowie dicks. And this is a little bit opposite from the norm, so that's kind of why I put that in here. All right, so releasing tray, sterilization is complete. What about the sterilized items? I'm trying to go through these, I know we're running out of time here. All right, so when you are releasing trays, um, you need to be using a some type of gun to show you what the temperature is. Something simple like this is really good. Um, if, as stated in Amy also, that you need to do this before handling, um, you should never touch in, um, packages when they're cooling. And if you don't have a gun, then you need to hover your hand over. So why do we say no touchy? No touchy, touchy. So when you touch trays, you can contaminate them. Um, you have microorganisms on your hand. When the trays are hot, so if you think about your face, when you are cleaning your face, you use hot water to clean your face, open your pores and clean. When you're done, you use cold water to close your pores, fill your, your face, right? So same concept happens with peel packs, filters, and wraps. When it is heated to a certain temperature, the pores in those, on those open allows the steam penetration or the sterilant penetration. And then once it cools to room temperature, it closes and seals. So if you touch it and you have microorganisms on your hand and the item's still hot, you will transfer those into the package. Also condensation. So condensation is another thing, right? We take a tray out of a 270 degree basic oven and then we bring it to an OR room, which is 60, 65 degrees on an average. We wind up creating condensation. There go, the tray is now contaminated. So that's another factor. We're not supposed to release them while they are hot. Um, the other thing too is, you know, when we're looking at times for trays to cool down, Wrap trays can take up to three hours, rigid containers up to 1.5 hours, one and a half, and peel packs can take up to 30 minutes to actually cool down to room temperature, and this varies. All right, last but not least, and this is extremely important, I wanted to talk about quality. So there are different quality aspects. Um, there's aspects, quality aspects that are required on a routine basis and quality aspects that help improve your department. So when we look at Amy, Amy ST90 is the process of healthcare products quality management system for processing in healthcare facilities. So I strongly, strongly suggest that your facility has ST90, 91 if you do endoscopes or flexible scopes, 58 for chemical sterilant, so VPro, Sterad, and 79 for steam, and then you have TIR 34, which is water. So I really suggest that you guys have those in your um, arsenal when you're <laughs> managing sterile processing. So we have our washer test. Something such as your TOSI, for instance, just an example, um, ensures that all aspects of your washer are functioning properly. Whatever you use, please make sure that it's testing all aspects of your washer. 
for ultrasonic tests, um, we have Sonicheck. So this tests the the cavitation or the um, yeah the cavitation of your sonic, just like we talked about. This might you need this in addition to your water uh, to your cleaning verification. Lumen connector. So remember that picture I told you guys to remember. I hope you remember um, for the Da Vinci hookups. This helps test those hookups to make sure that you're actually have the right enzymatic and flow working through those hookups. And then your cart washer test. If you have a cart washer that does cycles of instruments, you also have to test those as well. So um, you want to make sure that your cart washer, um, if you're, I'm sorry, if you're using that instrument cycle, you're testing that instrument cycle, and you're using the rack that you would use when you're doing the test. Um, and that's in addition to your regular cart washer, so if your cart washer cycle. Your machine filter, screening, and spinning arms. So all of these things should be checked on a daily basis, um, making sure that your spinning arms are spinning freely, there's nothing caught inside them. I have seen, like, tray tags stuck inside spinning arms. I It amazes me and blows my mind how they get in there, but it's like Houdini. I don't know, but it happens. So make sure that they're not clogged and you're checking those um, all the time. Um, these things should be documented. So another thing that should be tested is your automatic dispenser. So at the start of each shift, um, I like to say each shift because um, Joint Commission has more often than not asked why it doesn't happen each shift. Um, some people do it daily. But your dispenser should be tested to make sure that it's dispensing the right amount of enzymatic into your water. And so how you do that is just dispense your first, fill your sink up, dispense your first load into a measuring cup, make sure it measures five ounces, and then just dump that right into your sink. And that's pretty much simple. And if you do it every shift, staff get used to talking about it. So quality continues, boroscopes. That's another key factor that's coming up a lot. A lot of IFUs are talking about the use of boroscopes, enhanced visual inspection tools. Um, arthroscopy shavers, a lot of them talk about boroscopes now. So, and, you know, having one on a cart does not, I mean, I get if that's all you can do, but that really does not help or make staff utilize the equipment if they have to go searching for it. So um, boroscopes are a key factor, even in decontam. Um, magnifiers, using these for inspection of your instruments, also ensuring that you have the right magnification level per ISU. If you do da Vinci items or instruments, for example, they talk about using a 5X magnification. Um, and most of the little ma the magnifier magnifiers at the workstations, um, like you see pictures, don't go up to 5x. So there are different handheld ones that can be used, so um, that can be purchased. Insulation testing, um, this is not just for lap instruments. All instruments are to be insulated, that are insulated should be inspected. So this is part of any ST79 amendments number two um, that just came out in January of 2020, I believe, um, it's inspection of insulated instruments. This also includes cords, bipolar forceps, anything that is insulated um, should be checked and inspected. Um, audit forms. So going to the quality aspect, creating audit forms, you know, quick little, okay, hey, did a uh, point of use happen? You know, I'm going to do a post-case cart audit check, making sure that the that's happening or done, you know, documenting it, um, doing a joint commission awareness audit. Also, getting staff involved with these is really, really helpful. It helps them start seeing things on what they need to do. Policies and procedures, these are crucial to the department. Um, it allows the staff to know what your expectations are of them as a manager, and it allows you to manage them and hold everyone to the equal to equal and same level. Um, that's an instant employee buzzkill if they think that one person's getting away with something else. 
um, that they're, you're holding them accountable to. And it happens that having standard operating procedures or standard of work, whatever you want to call it, helps. One of the things that I've seen that's really helped a lot is huddle boards. Creating um, huddle time and one of the facilities that I used to be at, it, it was key. Every department did a huddle board, um, did a huddle, a shift huddle in front of a huddle board. Um, and these helped with communication, letting staff know what they were going into for their shift and all of the above. Um, another thing is called a Kamishibai board. Um, Kamishibai is basically a paper play, and this was used, this is a process used that you guys can look it up. It's for um, standard of work when you're implementing a new standard of work process and making sure that you're laying it out correctly and you're not running into um, some hiccups or there's some changes that need to be made. All right. Um, and I think that's it. Whew. All right. That's a wrap. No pun intended, guys. Thank you, Melinda, for, for such a great presentation. Um, that is all the time that we have left for today's session. I want to thank Melinda again for her insights and Hallmark for sponsoring today's webinar. And thank you also to our attendees for joining us today. We will be able to, the panelists will be able to follow up um, with some of your questions via, via email after this session. So enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you at future webinars. Thank you all so much.